Today's message is going to be on the story of Abraham and Isaac. And a little while ago, I read uh, the biography of Steve Jobs. And for those of you who are young enough to not know who he is, um, he was the founder of Apple. And the interesting thing about it was thinking that he's such a good person, such a person who's developed such technology, you'd assume that, well, he must be a good person in fact. But reading the biography, I started getting a little bit disappointed in him. I learned that not only did he uh, abandon his daughter, he abandoned his wife, he routinely abused employees, he even had the guile to park in the disabled spot at work. And you start reading through his story, you start reading through his biography, and you think that this person can't possibly have any redeeming qualities about him. But you know how it turns out. He ushered in an era, he ushered in a time where literally the world is at your fingertips. And that was something that he introduced us to. And you start to think that maybe a person's story, it's a little bit more than the negative outcomes, it's the story that is deeper than the wrong decisions that a person makes. There's something more to the story. And the story of Abraham and God's promise to him is very much like that. It's a story where you assume that this person keeps failing and failing and failing, and there can't be anything redeeming about him. He, he does this wrong and he does this wrong. And some of you might have thought that Abraham was this great guy. He made every right decision. And there are others of you who actually read your Bibles and you know that's not the case. And the story that we tell ourselves, the story that God tries to tell through our lives is not one that we always trust. It's not one that we always think, God's going to lead me to a place that is good. God's going to lead me to a place that has redemption. Sometimes we look at our story like the first few pages of Steve Jobs' biography, or like the negative stories about Abraham. And much like Abraham, I want you to, as you're listening to this message, think about the story that you tell yourself. Think about the story that you have told yourself of who you are and what is God doing with your life and where your direction is, where you're headed. Because I promise you that the story that he wants to tell through your life is significantly better than what you think your story is about. And the first thing that any account, any biography, any story has to have is it has to have a main character. And the main character of both the Abrahamic story and of your story is one of a flawed character. And what kind of person was Abraham? Was he a good person? Was he a bad person? What kind of person are you? Did Abraham always make good decisions? Did he make bad decisions? What about you? Did you make good decisions? Did you make bad decisions? What kind of person are you? And what was the motivation of Abraham? What guided him? What was in his heart all along? And the same question goes to you. What was in your heart? What is in your heart today? And what do you ultimately trust in? Because we, we can read what Abraham ultimately trusted in. What do you ultimately trust in? And Abraham's story is one of a person who ultimately, despite his shortcomings, despite everything that happened in his life, he was a man who trusted in God. He is the man who got up and he went and he pursued God despite all the mistakes that he made. Despite all the troubles that his life, that his choices ended up directing him towards, he nevertheless had a heart after God. And we know his motivations because God called him from a place where he was surrounded by family. He was surrounded by relatives. He was surrounded by his parents. And God said, look, I need you to leave Ur of the Chaldeans and I need you to go. And I need you to trust me because the story that I'm telling through your life is going to be far glorious, far better, far more magnificent and far more destructive maybe even than you could ever imagine. But it is my story. It is the story that I want to tell through you. And when he leaves that land, we think... He's going to be on a road, he's going to be on a path where the decisions that he makes are good. And as soon as his story begins, the story takes a detour. Because there's a famine in the land and he decides, you know what, I trust the story, but at the moment, 
I don't trust the story, and I'm going to go to Egypt, and I'm going to escape this famine there, and he, he picks things up in Egypt. The question to you is, when you have followed God, when you heard the call, and you might have left some of the things behind, but then troubles came into your life, did you continue to trust the story that God was telling through your life? Or did you escape to Egypt, to the world, to the things that you, in the past, found comfort in? And did you bring part of that with you? And his plans, they go awry because in Egypt, he loses his wife to Pharaoh. He almost gets killed because of these various ploys and plots that he makes. How we're going to escape this, how we're going to lie, how we're going to deceive. And he comes to a point in his life when he and Lot finally get out of Egypt and they're standing between a choice and, and he offers Lot this opportunity. He says, look, we have to split up and you can go to either Sodom and Gomorrah or to this land where, you know, it's basically desert. And he parts. He doesn't know what God is doing with his life, but he knows at this point there needs to be a split because he needs to pursue the story that God has given to him. And Abraham learns that despite his shortcomings, he still wants to stand for what God is doing. He still wants to make true that story that God gave him at the very beginning, the story of you will go out of this place, this place where your parents are, and I will give you an inheritance. I will give you a land that you will live in. Not only just you, but I will give you descendants. I will give you a multitude of descendants. Through those descendants, you will be able to bless the entire world. So I will give you children, and I will give a place to those children that they can live. And his life is not defined by the mistakes that he makes. He never remains in Egypt. He leaves. He continues pursuing that story despite making the mistake of running to Egypt. And his life is not defined by his mistakes. He has ugly chapters, but those chapters are there to teach him a lesson. And these are the defining traits that are required for a story, for your story, to be like Abraham's, to have a flawed character, and I think all of us would raise our hands that we have such a character, but also to have a heart for God, a heart that in the very end, despite all of your shortcomings, despite all of your mistakes, pursues God and knows that that is the place that I want to be. I don't want to be stuck where I am right now. I don't want to be stuck with my friends. I don't want to be stuck in the life that I lead. I want to pursue God. I don't know how I'm going to get there. But in the end, I'm always going to try and take a step in that direction. If you have your Bibles, open up Genesis 15. We're going to start reading through the story of Abraham as he works his way to make that promise a reality. He is not going to do it well. He is not going to do it without mistakes. But in the end, his heart will be after God. Genesis 15.1 after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward will be very great. Abram said, O God, what will you give me, since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir. But the one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look towards the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to them, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Your story, your story's main character is one that should be having a heart after God. In this passage, it, it, leave, it starts off right after Abraham let Lot go. So they came back from Egypt, and they're in this valley of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham splits from Lot. And he's already having trouble with the story. Because what we might assume as Abraham saying, well, you know, God, how, is these th how are these things really going to happen? I understand that we've left Egypt. I understand that I'm pursuing the story again. But how specifically will you make this happen? Will it be through my servant? Like, I need details. I can't just go off and try to make sense of the story when I don't have any details. What am I supposed to pursue? Who am I supposed to follow? 
And you'll notice that God doesn't answer after the first time that he asked that question. And in Hebrew passages, whenever somebody says something and then they say it again, that often assumes that there was no response. So he asked God a question and God didn't answer him. And he asked again, he's like, what am I going to do? Can you give me the specifics? Can you tell me my story? And God never wants to tell us the story. He doesn't want to tell us the story because we're going to go off and we're going to mess up that story. We're going to go off and we're going to make assumptions about what God wants and what he is doing through our lives. What relationships am I supposed to pursue? What classes am I supposed to take? What college am I supposed to go to? What work am I supposed to pursue? And we keep asking God, what is the story that you're trying to tell? And God says, just trust the story. Wherever I will lead you, whatever you will encounter, that is my story for you. That is where I want to lead you. Don't ask too many questions. Don't try to find out ahead of time where I'm guiding you because you're going to mess it up. And here Abraham tries to figure out the details of his story. He's become unsatisfied with the answer that God gave him that I'll give you this inheritance, that I'll give you this land. And his mind instantly tries to figure out the nitty-gritty details. Is it going to be Eliezer? Is it going to be somebody from the house? I thought it might have been Lot. Maybe, maybe he was going to carry on my name. But now I don't even know. I, I'm, I'm trying to do what you asked me to do. What are the details? Give me the details. And God didn't respond. And in the midst of the story, Abraham nevertheless shows that heart that pursues God. In the end, despite his outburst, despite his arrogance in asking God and demanding from God an answer, God nevertheless says, well, this is the way that I'll do it. And he believed, and for that moment, that was enough. And sometimes I want answers from God. Sometimes you want answers from God, and you say, what, what is the purpose of this struggle? What is the purpose of this trouble? Why was I made the way that I was made? Why does my mind work the way does it work? Why do I tend towards anxiety? Why do I tend towards depression? Why do I tend to be like this? Why am I so uh, sloppy with my work? Why am I so inattentive? Why, why, why? God, why have you done this? Why have you led me down this path? God says, trust the story that I'm trying to tell through your life. Your specific troubles, your specific shortcomings are me telling the story through you. A unique and special story. One that nobody else has. But one that in the end, much like the story about Abraham, will turn out well. Just follow it. And not only that, but when God has mercy on us, he'll often reveal a little bit of the story for us. And sometimes those answers are ones that we've begged out of him. And we think that they'll help us, but in fact, they hurt us. And I want you to trust the story. Not just when it's clear in front of you where you can see where God is taking you. Not just when you know, oh, this is the next step. Oh, this is how this will turn out. But when you don't, specifically when you don't. When you take a leap of faith and you say, God, I'm going to have a heart after you. I'm going to have a heart to answer the call that you made for me. I don't know how it will end up, but I desire to pursue it. And then Abraham continues his request of God. Verse 7, And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He said, O Lord God, Abraham said, "How how may I know that I will possess it? And again, the doubt comes in and comes through Abraham, this man that we have such respect for. He is again doubting God. He wants proof. So he, God, said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid them half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. And this is how we ruin our own story. We demand answers of God. And despite God's promise, Abraham nevertheless wanted God to give him proof. He said, how will this story that you've told me, how is this thing that you've given me a little bit of insight into, how will I know that it's coming true? 
Yes, you've promised a son. Yes, you've promised an inheritance, but I need something more. I need proof. God, I know you've shown me love and affection in my life. How are you going to prove it more? And since Abraham demands a promise from God, God says, I will give you that promise. And that promise is known as a covenant. And he asked Abraham to set up a covenant. He doesn't tell Abraham to cut the birds in half, uh, the animals in half. He doesn't tell him what to do with the birds. But Abraham knows what God is asking of him. And what it is, is he's making a betrothal covenant. A covenant that is made between the father of the bride and the groom. And what would typically be done is the animals would be cut in half. And they would be laid on each side in a gully where the blood could run downhill. And it would form this path through which both the father and the groom would walk through. And there's always two parties that are supposed to go through with this covenant. There would always be a greater party, which was the father of the bride, and there would be a lesser party, which would be the groom. And the groom would walk through and he would say, if I disrespect, if I dishonor your daughter, then the blood that splatters onto my white uh, robe will be a sign of what you can do to me. You can make my blood like the blood on the robe. Yet the father would also pass through. And that would be a symbol of, if I don't give you a daughter that is a virgin, then you can do that with my blood. I have broken my covenant. And this covenant, it's always made between a greater party and a lesser party. And Abraham knows this, and he just made a request from God, and God says, fine. You want to make this agreement, you want to make this promise with me, let's do this. Set it up and go through it. Set it up. And let us seal this covenant in blood. And Abraham has just made a realization. He is the first one that needs to go through that path. He is the lesser party. God is the greater party. And he has to start that walk. And you might have said the same thing to God at some point in the past. You might have made a promise to him at some point in the past. And you might have said, God, if you do this for me in this moment, and I've made those promises myself. I've said, God, if you will help my mom, she's in the hospital. I don't know how this will turn out. I don't trust the story. I don't trust where you're taking me. I promise you, if you bring her through this, I will do this and that for you. God, my family is in trouble right now. If you will help me through this, I promise to do this and that for you. And you have done the same in your moments of need. And you've assumed that you have any right and you have any ability to walk down this path, to make this covenant, to make this promise to God that if I don't fulfill it, you can do to me what I did to the animals. The price for your failed promise to God is death. If you stand before God and make such a promise, you have to fulfill that promise. This isn't an agreement with a friend. This is an agreement with God. This is a promise to God. And Abraham realized this as soon as the challenge happens. As soon as he gives this to God and he says, do this for me, prove it to me, God says, fine, I will prove it to you. But you start the process. And we come before God like Abraham, but oftentimes we don't realize what Abraham realized. He realized that the moment he steps into the blood, he is a dead man. He has no ability to uphold the promises that he made to God. You have no ability to uphold any of the promises that you make to God. Because in, there will be moments of weakness. There will be moments where you can't stand up and do what you promised to do. And what is God supposed to do with you at the moment? And Abraham, he feels like he had to do it, but then he realized what must happen if he does. He can't keep his end of the bargain. You can't keep your end of the bargain. The promise that you made to God of I will do and I will say and I will be will fail. Not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it'll fail. And you've just made a covenant with God that you can't keep. And what happened to Abraham? What happened when he 
didn't go through with the covenant. Verse 17, we read, this is what happened. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark. So what had happened? Abraham had waited so long, and in the previous verses we read that he had waited so long that the birds had started to scavenge the animals. He realized where he was at, and he wasn't ready to go through with it. And God came out, and, see, and this is what happened. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. And that's how God fixes our stories. He makes a covenant with himself on our behalf. He says, I understand that you will not be able to go through with this promise. I understand you will not be able to fulfill your end of the bargain. So I will go through as both parties. And God says, I will walk through as myself as the lesser party in your place. And I will walk as myself through this covenant blood path as the greater party. And I will bind myself to myself so that you can benefit from this covenant. So you can benefit from the promise that I've made for myself. Because God knows in the end that no matter how much you strive and desire to reach out for him, no matter how pure your heart is, much like Abraham's heart was pure and was after God, you will fail. And that story that he wanted to work through can only come about if he's there to help you. And the same God shows up all throughout Genesis. I grew up and I, I, I thought that the God of the Old Testament was fundamentally different from the God of the New Testament. And the more you delve into the stories that we read, of the accounts that we read, the more we realize he has been the same God. Even in the Old Testament, he says, I understand you can't fulfill this promise. I understand you can't do what's necessary, so I will step in on your behalf. I will walk the path, I will fulfill the promises that you can't. The ones that you'll fail at. The one that every single one of you has failed at. And you've broken the story that God wants to tell. And rather than demand perfection and punish us for when we inevitably fail, he says, no, I'm going to walk myself through this covenant path twice. And I'll make a promise with myself on your behalf so that I can fix the story that I want to tell through your life. And despite God for forgiving Abraham and saying, you know what, I will do this on your behalf, there are still consequences to the life that Abraham led, to the choices that he made. For his choices to leave the promised land and go down to Egypt, for his choices to lie about Sarah being his sister, for the choices that he made of going and doing and all of these mistakes, there are still consequences. Don't think in your mind that if God fixes your story that there won't be consequences for your past actions. But despite those consequences, God is still leading you on your story. And when we dis disregard God's story for our life, we end up bearing the consequences of those decisions. When Abraham left Egypt, it might have been a reasonable decision, a pragmatic decision to say, there's a famine in this land that God promised. I need to leave. There might have been a pragmatic reason. There might have been some reason for why you went off of the story, off the path that God laid out for you, and you went out and you delved into sin. It was more convenient. There was peer pressure. This was what I like to do. I really loved him. I really loved her. And that's why I went down that path. There are going to be consequences for that. And one of the things that we read as we read through Abraham's story is that when he left Egypt, he took some things with him. He took sheep and cow. He also took slaves. And one of those slaves' names was Hagar who became the maidservant of Sarah, whom Abraham tried to conceive a child with to fulfill this promise. So Abraham was pulled out of Egypt by God, but God was not able to pull Egypt out of Abraham. And God pulls us out of the world. He pulls us out of those friendships that don't benefit us. He pulls us out of those relationships that hurt us. But he, needs, he can't pull those relationships out of our heart. If we still pursue those things, if we still love those things, 
in the end, they will take us off the path of the story that God wants to tell to us. Our attachments to those things in the world, our attachments to our past life, to the things that have consequences for our life, they will continue to be in our heart unless we actively take them out. And those things will continue to make us stumble on this path to the story that God wants to tell through our lives. But there is not a day when God will leave you. There is not a day, there is not a consequence that God will not carry you through. And just like Abraham, you will go on to mess up the story. But God fixes our story by interceding on our behalf. And then we finally get to the story of Isaac. God finally starts to fulfill that promise in the way that Abraham was expecting Genesis 21, verse 1. We're going to read that, and then we're going to read a few verses in Genesis 22. Genesis uh, 21, 1. Then the Lord took note of Sarah as he said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the appointed time at which God has spoken to him, Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. In Genesis 22, 1, a few years had passed and God demanded something of Abraham again. The story had to continue. What he was trying to say through his life was not complete. Verse 1 of 22. Now it came after these things that God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. God said, now take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And then verse 9. Then they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, Behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and looked and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. And we've heard this story so many times. We've, we've got reading blindness. We've got story blindness to what this actually says. We look at it and we say, this is an amazing act of faith. A true hero, someone that we should aspire to, and we don't think about the story. This is a man who, by all accounts, heard and communicated with God audibly. That God then took him and said, take your son and then sacrifice him. Cut a hole in the body of your son so that I will be happy about it. And it makes a little bit more sense that in the time there were basically child sacrifices in all the religions. And what God is saying, look, you're going to have to trust the story that I'm trying to tell. You're assuming that I am just like the other gods. I'm just like they are, and I will ask you to do things like they asked to do, to sacrifice your children, to put some kind of um, precious thing on an altar for me. So go out and do that. Go out and do that, because I know you think of me like you think of those other gods. you, You assume that I am just like them. And God asks us, do you assume like I'm like everybody else, like the images of gods in your mind, of I'll give you retribution for the wrong actions, I'll punish you when you deserve it? Do you assume that that is the kind of God I am? Let's follow the story and find out whether I am truly a God like that. And he takes him up to that mountain. And Abraham did not want to follow this story. This story is one that ruins everything that he's been working for. Everything that God has promised him will be ruined in this moment if his son dies. 
There can be no fulfillment of the promise. But he does it anyway. And he didn't want to do it. And he gave God every opportunity to change his mind. He went out, and this journey to Mount Moria, it takes half a day at most. And it says for three days he walked to this mountain. And he kept saying, God, if there's another way. God, I'm giving you another opportunity. God, here's another day to change your mind and that we will not go through with this. I don't believe the story. I don't want to believe the story. This can't possibly be the story. And he's nearing the conclusion of what God wants to show him. And he has trusted to this, to this point. He's made mistakes. He has flaws. But his heart is fixed on God. Fixed on pursuing God. Despite the craziness that might be told him to do, he still believes it. He still pursues it. He still understands that this is the best thing for him. And what happens in the story? Abraham lifts the knife and he stabs his son. And he cuts deep and he cuts wide. And he can't look at his son. Because his son is there on the altar and he's saying, Daddy, look at me. Are you going to leave me here to die alone? Just please look at me. That's not the story that God told to Abraham on that day. What God said on that day is, I will provide. I am not like God's A, B, and C. I do not ask of you a sacrifice of your children. I do not ask of you a promise that you can't keep. Because not only will I give the sacrifice, I will keep the promise. And he sent his son, Jesus, to be on that altar. Because that is what God did. He took his son and he put him on the cross and he killed him and he looked away from him because he couldn't watch. He couldn't watch what he was doing to his son for your sake. And that is the story that God wants to tell through every single one of you. To say you have to trust in what I'm doing in your life. Despite how difficult it is, despite how meaningless it seems, I am doing for you the best thing that you can ever hope. And I want to encourage every single one of you, let God tell your story. I don't want you to tell your story. I don't want to tell, have you tell whatever fantasy you have in your mind of what your life is supposed to be about. Let God tell your story. Amen. Let's stand and I'll give you a moment to pray quietly and then I'll conclude. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful that the story you want to tell through my life is not one that I would tell. It's one that is riddled with shortcomings and mistakes. And despite all of those things, you desire for me to be your child. You don't want to be separate from me. You don't want to be split apart from me. You want me to be with you eternally, Lord. And I ask that I would be able to believe the story that you want to tell. A story that I don't always understand and a story that I don't always trust. But I want my heart to be always focused on you, fixed on you. And like Abraham, that I would be able to follow it to the very end. That you would show me what you want to show me and that through my life you'd be able to show others what you want to show others. And I pray for everyone here. All those who trust in the story and all those who don't who don't believe you have their best interest in mind. I ask all of us to come to the cross and look up at what you did for us. That promise that you made on the cross, the sacrifice that you made on that cross, and that we would be able to trust the story and all you've done for us. Amen.